Um, a few days before we had this massive rally in Washington, D.C., uh, an old friend of mine, Rabbi Asher Lopatin, who's now a rabbi in Detroit, we used to be together in Chicago, texted me and said, you're going to be there. I said, yeah. And he says, We're kind of joking around. And he sends me a text after that. And the text was the document. I don't know how he found it. He must be very organized or very lucky. But he sent me a piece of paper. It's a screenshot of it of a plan for the Israel fact sheet for the rally on April 15th, 2002. As it says, we are two groups traveling together, led by rabbis David Lerner and Asher Lopatin. Please be patient and calm throughout the day. There may be some bumps in the road. And at the rally, try to stay positive and have positive cheers. Bring your ruach. And then a lot of logistics. That was a time when we had the second intifada, if you remember it, 21 years ago. Unfortunately, a very difficult time. Hamas terrorists were blowing up buses and restaurants, cafes, the Hebrew University cafeteria, wedding halls, all kinds of locations. And American Jewry came together with this big rally on the mall. And we wanted to stand up for Israel and share what was going on in the world. And now, 21 years later, we have to do the same, but I would say it's after a much worse terrorist attack and an enemy who has enmeshed itself in the civilian population to an extent that we've never seen buildings and infrastructure of terror that's never been built like this in all of human history with its tunnels. The Sorry. Usher's text on that day um, was about how we could organize for this rally. And I have to say, let me get myself straightened out here. There's a lot of emotion. Usher was texting me. And he and I started to kind of joke around a little bit because of the intensity of the moment and, and broke it a little bit. And so Asher said, how big is your group? I told him, I said, we're traveling on a commercial plane together. We have buses run by the Federation and we have a chartered plane. So he just responded, OK, I have three chartered planes going. I said, okay, you win. Our Tuesday on Tuesday, our groups uh, traveled separately and together. Those of us who were on the same plane with me and Mayor um, came down to DC with a little bit of a plan. Sadly, I've done these rallies now a number of times for Israel. Some of you were together in 1987 for the rally for Soviet Jewry with me and a quarter of a million other people. Yeah. Uh, we had one that our community was a part of here in Darfur, and for Darfur in 2006. And I kind of have it down to a science. You take a flight, you go right into Reagan, you take the Metro, you're at the National Mall, you turn around, you're back on the Metro, you're on a flight, boom. Our group did it in 13 hours, not bad. But the experience of standing under the warm sun that afternoon, surrounded by 300,000 people, was incredibly powerful. Someone pointed out that it was the largest gathering of Jews outside of the land of Israel since Mount Sinai. Now, many media outlets said there were tens of thousands of people, and, and that simply was not true. And some media outlets relegated this to some back page story 
buried in a metro section as they did in the Washington Post. And I can't tell you how disappointing that is to not feel what we felt. For us on the National Mall, it was a powerful, awesome feeling. There was strength in our numbers. There was strength in our voices in the peaceful demands that we had to release the hostages, to support Israel in our time of need, and to decry the ferocious rise in anti-Semitism that we see in so many different places over the last six weeks. It's also important to note, with that many people, there was not one incident of any violence whatsoever. Hundreds of thousands of people, literally 5% of the American Jewish population was there. The only problems I heard about were about the chartered planes. Because it turns out if you charter a ton of planes and send them all to the same airport to Dulles, they don't have any landing spots for them. There are already a lot of other planes coming in. So that was a little tricky as our Boston group, I'm sorry, Ruth and others, <laughs> sat on the runway for many hours and some of them didn't get there at all. My friend Osher's two of the planes from Detroit had problems because the bus drivers wouldn't take them from the planes to the rally when they found out it was a rally to support Israel. Beyond all the complicated logistics of everything this week, it's not easy to bring the American Jewish world together. We are diverse. We have different opinions and nuances about Israel and the current situation. There are religious and political differences. For example, the left, I'll say including me, had to swallow having Pastor John Hagee speak at the rally. An extreme right figure and very problematic as far as I'm concerned. Maybe some people on the right had problems with Van Jones, a more liberal political commentator speaking. I, for one, was a little bit annoyed that while there was great music and singers at the rally, women were not allowed to lead the singing as for some in the Orthodox world, it's wrong for women to sing publicly. But even with all that, we found a way to come together and it was great. There were powerful speakers, including some of the hostages. And I just have to say, I really don't know how they do this. These parents get up all over the world. Where do they get the emotional courage to bear their souls day after day, wherever they are speaking? That's why we have empty chairs for the hostages in the shul, an empty table for them in the social hall. On Sunday at Boston Common from 10 to 1, there'll be an installation of a Shabbat table with 240 seats. If you want to join that or help set up, Please go and check it out. And I want to pause just for a moment for something really problematic that I've seen, which is the ripping down of posters of hostages. Avigal Dan, three years old. Shachar Dan Calderon, 16 years old. These are people, by the way, of all faiths. Ali and I were listening to a podcast of an Israeli Arab Palestinian who was taken hostage. Imagining the complexity that his family, he's dealing with. These are people of, I think, 25 different nationalities, all different religions, including 54 people from Thailand. It's the highest number of American hostages taken since 1979 when Iran seized if you remember, 66 American citizens at the U.S. Embassy and held 52 of them for one year. Why is this not on the front page of the newspaper every day? And what kind of person takes down these flyers? Really, I have to say, I don't understand. Our own Noah Fay, daughter of Miriam Wright and Aaron Fay, gave... an eloquent and fiery speech of what she's experiencing on Columbia's campus and what we can do. She was totally inspiring. And when she's back here, I can't wait for her to speak to our teens and to all of us. Her words gave me 
hope for the future. And I was uh, shepping a little bit of Nachas for the two of you. And you can watch her talk. We'll share the link. It's well worth watching her speech. You also will feel a sense of pride. All in all, it was a day of achdut ha'am. It was a day of the unity of the Jewish people during a time of crisis, which is, I think, why we've been really coming together more and more as a community. Friday night, Shabbat, Minyan, classes, learning. We need each other. This is a time where we need so much. We need our hostages home, and we need Hamas to no longer be able to hurt us. We need to end their reign of terror, which goes all the way back to the 90s, when they murdered two of my friends as well in 1996. We need to end this perpetual state of war, which is, of course, what they want. I want to be clear. Hamas is something very simple. They are a genocidal terrorist organization who does not care if their own people will live or die. Their entire plan was to kill Israelis in such horrific ways and take hostages that Israel would have to go into Gaza and then to use their own children. They knew and wanted as many civilians in Gaza to be killed as possible so that other terrorist groups, Iran's proxies, Hezbollah in Lebanon, the Houthis in Yemen, uh, Syrian militia groups would all attack Israel, if not Iran itself. And of course, it wanted to turn world opinion against Israel. Now, I, I want to break this down because you've probably seen a lot of signs Israel is committing a genocide. This is a dangerous and false accusation. If Israel wanted to commit a genocide, unfortunately, it could. It could just bomb people indiscriminately and not tell them that they were bombing. It could not tell them to move out of an area, which it is. It could not send them warnings. It could do whatever it wanted. So that's not genocide. That's an attempt to deal with the situation. That's trying to live up to the ethical rules of war, which have been part of the Jewish tradition and now are part of international law. On the other hand, Hamas is a genocidal terrorist organization. It says it in their charter. Just read it. It says not only that they want to destroy Israel, but kill every Jew. It's right there, explicit. Listen to what people say. Listen to what they write. They want all of Israel destroyed. They don't want a peace agreement on any border, 67 or otherwise. And as it's chanted all over, <clears throat> from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. What does this mean? Shall be free of Jews. That's what they're chanting on college campuses across our country and across the world, free of Jews. I want to say a word about Hamas. They began this, these terrorist attacks on October 7th, with, which would be terrible crimes against humanity, if you're looking it up in international law. And then every day they're violating the laws of war. Right? They are fighting within a civilian population placing its military installations within mosques, apartment buildings, and hospitals. How does it fight? It fights not with its uniforms, which it has, but people wearing T-shirts and, and flip-flops, carrying an RPG, who can run out of a tunnel and pop out of any place and shoot it. You can watch the, the videos of this. Hamas distributes them. How do you fight like that? How do you fight someone who doesn't care about the rules of law, the rules of war, when you do? You want to hear an excellent analysis of this? Listen to Tal Becker's uh, from the Hartman Institute's podcast. I'll send the link. As I was reading the Torah reading this week for inspiration, 
I realized that it actually contains very direct parallels to this moment. First, the Torah says that Esau, Jacob's brother, the brawn in the story, as Alex reminded us, goes and marries a woman named Yehudit. It's very interesting. Yehudit Judith, right? A very Jewish name. He marries Yehudit, and she is the daughter of Be'eri. What does Be'eri mean? My well. And Be'eri is the name of the kibbutz, where Vivian was from. Some of the most terrific attacks took place. So in the middle of the Parsha, we suddenly have all of this talk about wells. We're digging wells. We're looking for water. Now, wells are, of course, critical in the land of Israel because it doesn't rain for half of the year. So you need water. What does Isaac do in the reading? He goes around digging wells. It says that his father Abraham had dug wells. The Philistines stopped them up, and so he had to go and redig them. There's quarrel, though, between Isaac and the people of the area, the people of Gerar. And they keep fighting with him as he digs up a well. So the first well is called Asek, which means contention. And the second well is called Sitna, hostility, because these wells suddenly bring them into fighting. And finally, he digs a third well. And this well, the fighting ends. The people and Isaac dig a well that's no longer a problem. It's called Rechovot, a wide space, a wide well. Perhaps meaning you don't have to fight over it. Archaeologists think that this place is called today Ruchebe, in a kind of Bedouin area about 19 miles southwest of Beersheba, where they found ancient agricultural uh, traces of settlements there. And it is not the modern city of Rehovot, which is outside of Tel Aviv, a city of 150,000. Now, what's so interesting to me is that after this well is dug, after this well is dug and Isaac digs it, suddenly this bigger well, Isaac is given a blessing by God. Isaac has a different experience. And this well doesn't be, become contested as the others do. Avimelech, the king of Gerar, this population around Isaac, then comes to him. And they've been fighting with him nonstop. But now things are different. Isaac asks him, why have you come to me? We've been at war. You've been so hostile to me. Why are you coming to me? And the king of Gar says, we see that God is with you, which is confusing. What does it mean that God is with you? Maybe you're so successful. You're, I don't know, you're, you're great with water. You, you have a lot to offer. I want to be blessed like you're being blessed. Maybe it means that God is with you. You're a person of character. You're a person of, of strong moral character who wants to do good. And they want to be his friend. And they ask him for a peace treaty. They say that we're going to treat you well, Isaac. And we want rock tov. We want just good for you. And Isaac makes a meal for them. They sit and eat and drink. And he sends them off. Bishalom, as the text states, in peace. Peace agreement. Read this over a few times. Because it's not something I, I really paid attention to before. And it was so beautiful. You can dig underground for a water. You can dig to cooperate. Or, of course, you can dig for something very different. You can take your money and invest in something that's going to sustain yourselves, your people, your community, and thus build a different reality. Or you can do something very different. You can ignore your people. You can take the money and not pursue peace. You can embezzle it. You can create a terrorist army. Wells of wealth or wells of war. And so now Israel has to 
find these wells, the wells that have the hostages, and discern in this impossible situation who is at war with them, who's a terrorist, and who's not. Has to go into every building. They're trying with caution and precision. I'm sure you've watched. They brought in Arabic-speaking doctors, brought medicine to those in need as they did in Shifa Hospital this week. This is very, very hard, very risky, and of course, a PR nightmare. Israel's asking us for one simple thing, one thing, to send them wells of support, wells of love, say we've got your back. And this week we, we dug those wells in DC, we reminded each other that we can be strong and resilient people as we've have for thousands of years of our history, that we demand to get our hostages back. And the world should understand what it means to be a moral army and how to do your best against terrorist civilian army. Our Israeli friends sent us many messages of how grateful they were that we made the effort to go. They told us what it means to them. And I have to say that after all this, God willing, it should pass soon. And then, it's very important, and then, and then we will, and we must sit down and make peace, just as Isaac did with the king of Gerar almost 4,000 years ago. Towards the end of the rally, we sang Achenu. All of us, sisters and brothers, all people. Right? We demand, as we say at every service, we demand the release of the hostages. We pray for those who suffer oppression and imprisonment, for those who wander over sea and land. We ask that they be delivered from darkness to light, from subjugation to redemption. Let us say, Amen.